Today, we're going to look at the top decks from Magic 30 World Championship and break down the standard metagame. Waffles in the morning, syrup sweet and slow. Golden stacks are rising, sunrise in the glow. Sticky choice so grand, breakfast on demand. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Waffle Cast. Captain Waffles here. So we're going to be breaking down uh, the metagame from the the uh, standard World Magic 30 Championship. So uh, we're going to look at what the deck list percentage was, how many decks of certain types were presented to the format uh, for the tournament. And then we're going to break down uh, certain decks from the architect. Well, I I'm not going to go like too in-depth with it. I'm going to just show you the deck list. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it, what success it had, where it fell into the rankings, things like that. And then throughout the week, I'm going to be releasing deck tech videos on uh, a lot of the top eight deck lists. And we're going to look at the um, what the deck did well, what the deck kind of did poorly in some of the matchups, because I watched a lot of the matchups. And then we're going to kind of go over uh, what the cost is if you want to assemble this in paper. And the... Um, uh, God, why am I blanking right now? And like the uh, maybe possible ways of how the deck is weak, you know, things like that. So uh, let's jump into this. So the current metagame, um, I got to find my graphic here. <laughs> so the current metagame uh, that was presented at Magic World 30 Championship in Vegas, uh, 20 of the decks, which was 17.7% .7 of the field, was Gruul Prowess. It was the most popular deck to play, um, mainly because of Leyline of Resonance, but only three of the, the 20 decks had four copies of Leyline of Resonance. So um, the card was banned before the tournament, but it was still playable in this tournament, being that these players had to submit their decks at a certain time before the banning happened. So um, then we go into Demir Midrange, which was 16 uh, decks presented and it's 14.2 percent of the field azorus oculus was 13 decks at 11.5 domain 13 decks at 11.5 team of prowess nine decks at eight percent demir demons nine per nine decks at eight percent golgari midrange nine decks at eight percent jeskai convoke which was uh six of them presented at 5.3 percent and golgari ramp at five decks at 4.4 percent and then there was other decks like mono red and a couple other deck archetypes that came in that was 13 it was 11.5 percent of the field so looking at this barring like the banning like you know the banning took half and everything i feel like this is a relatively healthy format like you're not seeing a ton of uh of like the same amount of decks across like there's a pretty healthy spread of deck count per deck archetype. So I feel like standard is probably the healthiest it's been in a long time. Um, and then if you look at like some of the deck lists, like Sheldred is one of those cards that a lot of people were calling to be banned and it wasn't as prevalent. Um, yeah, it did make an impact in some of the games and it was around, but it wasn't like the big baddie of the tournament. So let's get into the first one of these um, archetypes that I wanna talk about. So I'm gonna post, um, as I talk about these, I'm gonna post. There's gonna be an image on the screen showing the 60 list. None of the sideboard, just the 60 list, and we're gonna be looking at it. And the first one I want to look at is Azorus Oculus. Okay, so this is Yasuka's list, and I thought it was a really interesting deck idea, but the it, it and it had one of the better win percentages on the weekend, but not a single copy got into top eight. So the deck is literally trying to fill the graveyard as fast as possibly possible to recommission or helping hand back an Oculus or a Hadi Dijin and be able to just beat down your opponent with these big flyers. Um, the biggest weakness that this deck had was a lot of the uh, mid-range decks that were running black were running two to three copies of Anoint with Affliction. So that right there just exiles it out of the graveyard and makes it harder for you to bring it back with a recursion. Being that there's only eight real threats in this deck, those decks had a very good chance of removing a couple of those threats and then just going to town because there's no other way to protect itself other than having these big monstrous flyers out. So the big weakness of this deck is you are a glass cannon. You are trying to get out one or two of these big threats and end the game quickly off of tempoing them with Soul's Partition, uh, Afira's Dispersal, Into the Flood Maw, things like that. So, whereas I think the deck is good, 
Um, I just think it has a very fatal flaw, which is that there is no pressure unless you have the Hadi Dijin or Oculus out. So once that pressure is gone, the mid-range decks are free to do whatever they want. All right, so now I'm going to get into uh, the top eight lists because no Oculus made it, no Domain Ramp made it, no Teamer Prowess made it, no Jeskai Convoke made it. All of those decks, uh, they had kind of a poor showing other than the Oculus. Um, and some of the people that were piloting the Oculus uh, did poorly in draft. So it kind of skewed their numbers into making top eight. So, all right. So moving on to Kai Bude's Demir midrange. So there were two Demir decks that really stood out in this, this tournament. You had the Demir Demons and the Demir midrange. The Demir midrange was actually more popular than the Demons, but I feel like the Demons had a better strategy. So... The Demir mid-range, you're all about value. You're you're putting in Enduring Curiosity, Kato, you got the Masterminds, the Deep Cavern Bats to really, you know, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your opponent with the card draw, manipulating their draws by taking stuff away. I like the one of Tishana's Tidebinder in here to really stop, like, a man land for a turn or maybe just cut off some... You know, like you could do it to the to the excruciated demon when it came into play, so that you don't get milled out. Um, but it's very just like couple counter spills, some removal, and just get there with the flyers and the endearing curiosity, and outdraw your opponent and just out tempo them. Um, Restless Reef, Fountain Point, really Fountain Point, Fountain Port, really good lands in this deck. Fountain Port was an all-star land over the weekend, played in probably every deck that it could be played in. Just being able to pay the life to make a fish and then use it later to draw a card or like chump block draw a card or even get in with the fish token with an enduring curiosity out to draw an additional card. You know, it was a really good land. So this deck plays very you know, very mid rangey. It's all about tempoing and, and getting your opponent um, to run out of gas while you're just beating them down with these flyers and getting in for the game. So um, this was Kai's list, very good list. Uh, I would say the one weakness is, is if you're, it, uh, one of the weaknesses I found while watching this was if you miss your land drops, you fall behind very quickly if your opponent is keeping his land drops going. Um, so you definitely want to make sure you hit your land drops. Sometimes you got to sacrifice a st three steps ahead to dig into those land drops. But other than that, I think it's a very solid deck. Um, so here we get into, so Demir Demons had, I believe, two, um, uh, two deck lists into the top eight, which one of them we'll get to later. Uh, so this was Hafam. It's very similar to the Demir mid-range. The only difference is, is you're sacrificing counter spells for more disruption like duress and then your unholy annexes to get you more card draw. You're also more along the lines of playing the demons so that you're not taking the life off the unholy annex. You're actually gaining life and draining your opponent to really get them down faster. Um, there is two one-hit combos in this deck, either you have uh, Bloodletter of Alcazar out and you hit them with an Unstoppable Slasher and they die instantly. Or you have Bloodletter of Alcazar out and you rush up Dread and instantly kill them. Um, so this, this Demir deck had a fast win con. We'll look at the other Demir decks fast win con, but this was, it plays very straightforward. Kill your opponent, outdraw them, and you know, disrupt them as much as possible. This one didn't play Fountain Port, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I feel like instead of playing Escape Tunnel, I would I would play uh, Fountain Port. Point Port. God, words are hard. Um, but realistically, the weakness of this deck is if you just if you flood out, you miss your land drops, or you just draw too many in, uninteractive spells, um, and you just can't you can't keep your creatures alive, you just lose. So, um, but it's a very strong deck. Um, so here we go into, so Gruul Prowess had two into the top, uh, top eight here. So here's another list. So this is why I picked the, uh, the one list versus this list. So this one did not play Screaming Nemesis, but it did play a one of Scorching Shot and it played a couple Torch the Towers in the main board. Um, I know the Scorching sc Shot was for the higher end creatures like Sheldred, um, blood letter of Alcazar, you know, things like that that were very problemsome if they hit the board and you can't deal with them because 
this deck struggles to deal with bigger creatures. Um, if you get outclassed, you are going to lose very fast in these type of, uh, or not you're going to lose very fast, you're going to lose this slow draining death if you can't outclass your opponent fast enough with these smaller creatures. So again, we talked about Gruul Prowess. I just wanted to highlight that this one has the Scorching Shot, the Porch, Torch the Tower, Borch the Tower, Torch the Tower as I butcher these words, um, but it's it plays along the same strategy of just killing your opponent as quickly as possible. So now that we've seen two Gruul Prowess's decks, let's get into the other deck here. Um, this was in the 13 deck count of 11.5%, Mono Red Aggro. So Quinn piloted this to a top four performance. So he won his uh, quarterfinal match, went into the top four, and I was going to be shocked if this deck won the tournament, uh, first of all, because you everyone knows my stance on Mono Red. I can't stand Mono Red. But it's straightforward, right? 21 lands, tons of one drop two drops to get there um i think the biggest real um like tech of this deck was probably the witch Doctor frenzy just to really get in for killing the sheldred but i did watch a couple games where he just witch dockered his nemesis and domed him for five like it's a really good strategy to do um, because you're going to be attacking with the nemesis and if they got a block you know, like what's really good is if they block with like a 2 2 and they're like, yeah, whatever, I'll take the two damage because I'm going to block other stuff and kill it. And then you'd Witch Stalker. That's seven damage from a Nemesis. Yeah, your Nemesis dies, but more than likely you're probably killing them. Um, but even then, just getting in with Witch Stalker, because if your Witch Stalker costs four, if you've got Nemesis attacking, that means you've got three mana and you can easily get three in and deal five and deal eight damage unchecked. So, again, it's a very fast, hyper-aggressive deck. The weakness is, is if your opponent can slow you down, if they can gain some life back and they can keep creatures off the board, or you flood out, they're probably going to win the game. It's a very glass cannon deck. Go really fast um, and try to just destroy your opponent as fast as possible. So, getting into um, Seth Manfield here, who played against Javier Dominguez in the top four. Um, Seth Manfield played Golgari Ramp, which was a very interesting style of deck. Uh, Golgari Midrange and Golgari Ramp are similar, and you'll see with the next deck we go into. But basically what it wanted to do was get Overlord of the Haunt out, pump up that mana as fast as possible so that it could either A, Deadly Cover Up, Gix Command, um, Outrageous Robbery. You know, depending on what they're playing, it had Harvester of Misery in it. That was like its way of like clearing the board and getting back into the game. And you know, you have the three anoints with the cut downs and the go for the throats. Up the beanstalk was the like the all-star of this deck, in my opinion, because if you play up the beanstalk on turn two and then you play the Overlord of the Haunt for impending, it still counts as a five cost creature. So you're drawing a card and getting a land or a five cost spell. So you're drawing a card and getting a land. Like that's just ridiculous um so then you know you harvester of misery things like that deadly cover up you're drawing cards while killing off all their stuff glissa is a problem to deal with that thing if it's on the board and you have no answer for it it's just gonna stonewall a lot of decks um one pillage of the bog to really help dig and then there you go with the fountain port the restless cottage the good lands in there demolition field also to counteract other relentless cottage or restless cottages and other lands fountain ports things like that really solid deck i mean obviously this deck does have a weakness um a lot of it was if you come out quick enough like the girl prowess or the mono red or things like that if they could come out fast enough and this deck didn't have enough to stop it it got beat down quickly um, on top of that, it did stumble on lands a lot of times. I don't know if the land count is incorrect, but I mean, me questioning these pros talking about land count, I mean, I'm not trying to do that, but maybe the Sunken Citadel needs to be something else, or maybe, you know, it needs to be looked at a little bit differently, but I don't know. Um, there is enough card draw. There is the ramp. Maybe because of the ramp, uh, it's a little bit of a struggle to get those lands. I don't know, but I feel like 
you know, most decks, if you're not hitting your land drops, you're going to struggle. But for the most part, it's a pretty solid deck. Moving into the other iteration of this deck, which is Golgari Midrange. This is what Marcio Carvalho played to get into the finals for a third time. Uh, Archery in the Dross, Gliss of Suns, uh, Slayer, and one copy of Sentinel. I thought that was interesting. Um, played four of the Broncos, four of the Moss Dread Knights. You know, you're 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 wanting to draw cards in this deck. You you have the Unholy Annex. You got to get that gas. Keep going to keep up with some of these decks. I like the throwback um, as like a way to gain some life, destroy some enchantments. You know, destroy an Unholy Annex. Um, all kinds of different things. You can exile graveyards. It was really good against Oculus. Um, this is a very very strong list. Um, I don't see a real weakness in it other than I don't know if I like the one of uh, Steel and Oil, but you have to remember, this was an open deck list tournament. So you knew what you were playing against. You knew who, you, who your opponent was playing, all of those different things. So um, when you play in an open deck list versus a closed deck list, you, ha you can get away with a little bit more of these strategies and things and knowing what to be expecting. So um, all in all, like the last, the top, these guys, Marcio and Javi playing in the finals, it was a great finals. Like they really went toe to toe with each other and it was a great match to watch. If you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. Um, and you can really see the decks showcased. So that's this one. And then here's the championship deck right here. Javier Dominguez with Demir Demons. It basically was a mill deck because their whole strategy was to execute demon, the Doomsday Demon you and then mill you out with Jace and game over. You took your turn and you died. Um, that was literally the biggest win condition of the deck. The other win condition is play an Archfiend of the Dross, beat your opponent down with some flyers, and just get there. Um, and then, you know... If you had to, I watched him do this to Seth Manfield where he's like, play Jace, mill you, play Jace, mill you. In the same turn, mill 30 cards, went to Seth's turn, and he had one turn to, to deal 16 points of damage. And in a mid-range deck, they don't have that much firepower to do that. So, I mean, based he, he almost was able to. Uh, if things would have went correctly in his way, um, he could have got him down to like two and then had him die on his instep or something like that. But it just didn't work out. So it was a it was a very interesting match, uh, very uh, very close. So and Javier did the reverse sweep on him. I mean, Manfield was up 2-0 on him, and he 3-0'd him after sideboard. But there you go with the fountain port in there, restless reef, um, having that extra pressure and uh, draws there. Annoying with affliction was a powerhouse uh, common this weekend. Um, it dealt with a lot of things, a lot of creatures, a lot of problems very easily and i've been playing with this card for a while so i i'm very happy to see that it's making s quite an impact in standard um but there you go guys that is the that's pretty much the breakdown of what was being played um how everyone did um demir demons only had nine but nine decks uh presented in the format and two of them made top eight um one golgari one golgari ramp one golgari midrange so out of the like top decks, only three out of 36 made it into the top eight. Whereas with Demir Demons, Golgari Ramp, and Golgari Midrange, you had 18, 20, you had four out of 23. So you had a much better percentage with those lower um, percentage of the field decks that came in. I think a lot of that has to do with one, there was a lot more surprise factor with these decks. I think Demir Demons really hasn't been running around that much on Arena. Uh, same thing kind of with Golgari Ramp and Midrange. Yes, there are variants of the deck out there. So it's a little bit more known than Demir Demons. But I think moving forward, uh, we're going to see a lot more Demir Demons on Arena. We're going to see a lot more of Golgari on Arena. I wouldn't be surprised if some new deck emerges to fight these. And with that being said, I will be working on a deck to try to combat uh the demir golgari decks because i feel like they are the most prominent decks out there and i think if i can build a deck to beat those they'll more likely be able to beat girl prowess and oculus and stuff like that so uh be on the lookout for that i will be breaking down demir demons uh golgari midrange and golgari ramp a lot more in a deck tech video coming out soon 
Um, but I don't want to take any more of your guys' time because this is going to be a long video explaining a lot of this. I hope you guys got a lot of good information out of this. Um, I'm putting this out there for a lot of you competitive players. I know you guys are going to be watching other channels, but this is my opinion. This is my breakdown of the standard metagame and what currently happened at the championship. I mean, I'd love to hear you guys' comments down below. What do you think? Uh, do you think Demir Demons is actually a really good deck or do you think it's just absolute garbage and it got lucky? Um, I would love to hear you guys' opinions. Um, but other than that, I'm going to leave you guys the same way I always leave you. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Stay syrupy, my friends. Waffles in the morning, syrup seed and slow.